All right, this is another Texas History Lecture uh, continuing along the uh, life and times of Lyndon Johnson. And uh, so we pick up today with Johnson running for the United States Senate uh, for the first time in 1941. At the end of the previous lecture, I introduced a name to you uh, that some of you are familiar with because of the movie, where, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, that movie starred uh, George Clooney and several other fairly prominent character actors in the about the year 2000, maybe 2001, almost 20-year-old movie at this point in time. Maybe it is 20 years old. Anyways, one of the uh, secondary characters in that movie is uh, the governor of Mississippi, or at least in that movie is called the governor of Mississippi, uh, a fellow named... Uh, uh, Papio Daniel. The reality is, is that Papio Daniel was a real person and he was not governor of Mississippi, but he was in fact governor of Texas and a U.S. senator from Texas for a period of time in the 1930s and in the 1940s. But the life of Papio Daniel, Wilbert Lee O'Daniel, uh, is one of, the, or as you might see it on your review sheet, W. Lee O'Daniel, is a uh, tale of a man coming out of nowhere and becoming, in this case, a governor and later senator. Uh, it may be a cautionary tale, but it is certainly an interesting tale uh, with regard to politics, celebrity, and so forth. Uh, Papio Daniel uh, was not born in Texas. He was born in Ohio, and he's married to a woman named Merle. Uh, she was uh, a lady or woman, and, but who in their right mind would uh, saddle their daughter with the name of Merle? But I've seen, uh, uh, and this is one that comes out in Louisiana, there was one lady who was named, uh, her name was Huey, because she was born on the same day that Huey Long had been inaugurated governor. That was her first name, but he Huey Elizabeth East was her name. And uh, at least I would think that she went by the, uh, the name Elizabeth or Liz instead of Huey. Uh, but anyway, sometimes uh, we saddle our children with uh, some unusual names. And in this case, uh, Merle uh, O'Daniel as well had that. But Pappy O'Daniel, he was, uh, let's say this uh, first about him, he's an honest man, mostly. Unlike Johnson, who has uh, a well-known history of and proclivity to uh, chase uh, women uh, and to have his peccadilloes, his little affairs, as you might say, uh, the fact is is that O'Daniel was, uh, in, the, in the main, in that sense, he was a, a, you know, an honest man. He didn't drink either, unlike, say, Johnson. Johnson drank quite a bit. Uh, O'Daniel was a teetotaler. When teetotaling was uh, in favor, meaning uh, prior to Prohibition, uh, and on top of that, after Prohibition had ended in the 1930s, he was a teetotaler. He just didn't drink. You come across people like that, maybe a couple of you watching that uh, have that uh, general principle, whether it's a religiously uh, motivated principle or just uh, you never have uh, thought much of people drinking or getting drunk, uh, each their own. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's quite, uh, frankly, it's quite honorable, I guess. The thing is, is that uh, O'Daniel was, uh, he was uh, a fairly straight arrow in that sense, an immaculate dresser. Uh, he was, uh, he was a salesman. He was a born salesman. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But O'Daniel is uh, going to, before he becomes a politician, he moves to Texas and he proceeds to start selling in the 1920s, uh, late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, a type of flour. It's, uh, it was from the Burris Flour Mill up in Fort Worth, the Burris Flour Mill in Fort Worth, and uh, when he, it was uh, called a light crust flour, light crust dough. Uh, never failed, et cetera, and so on. Uh, obviously, especially in that time period, he is pitch, going to pitch this flower at a certain segment of the audience. Uh, all advertisers know, or at least all advertisers ought to know who their audience is. Uh, if you look at, uh, I used to talked about alcohol just a second ago. If you look at beer advertisers, generally speaking, they don't uh, put overweight, uh, middle-aged, balding men uh, on uh, those beer commercials. They put young men and young women who are having fun and being cool. Some of them say if it's like, uh, I use, for example, uh, Michelob Ultra Light. Uh, which is uh, oftentimes uh, promoted itself it's since its entire existence for 18, 20 years now as uh, I call it the sports beer. Go run a marathon, drink a Michelob Ultra Light and feel good about yourself and then go, you know, being cool. Uh, but you got to know your audience. I mean, to go move away from that example, you know, if you've ever watched uh, pro uh, TV programs with your grandparents that are pitched, uh, rather programs that are viewed by the older population, they're, they're promoting gold, silver, and other uh, old person products. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, there's a, very, there's a, there's a whole uh, 
uh, horizon. There's a whole sky, uh, canopy of old person products that are pitched uh, that are out there and on and on. I mean, just think about your own childhood. If you ever watch TV uh, or uh, I guess it'd be a phone at this point, perhaps. But if you ever watch TV as a kid on the TV, uh, the kids uh, stations like the Disney's and so forth, like my daughter, Caroline, uh, who's about four and a half, almost five now, uh, you see stuff pitched to her. Anyways, all I'm saying is is that uh, he knew his audience, which were mostly women, uh, and in the 1930s and in the 1940s, uh, those women, most women were uh, homemakers, were domestic. Uh, there were, of course, some women who did work outside of the home. Some were school teachers or clerks or what have you, uh, secretaries. But the vast majority of women in the United States in the night, excuse me, the early 20th century, when we're talking, were uh, at home. Uh, something else to keep in mind too, when we talk about Pappy O'Daniel. Is, is that he's one of the first, now moving to his political realm a little bit, uh, he is really one of the first modern politicians. And the thing about pol politics in the early 20th century, especially after radio comes into vogue as a medium, uh, or median, I guess you could say, to get your message across. If, you're, if you look at me, you can see right over here where I'm pointing down at, uh, that's a big old microphone, which is essentially a, a podcast microphone that I bought a year or two ago uh, to record lectures just like this. Uh, it's a really great microphone, and it's kind of modeled off of the old ones that you saw, uh, say, 80 years ago. 50 years ago, that sort of thing there, those uh, big uh, stand microphones. And, and I kind of, because of historian, I, I bit and bought it, but it's a very good one. It's not just uh, an ornament. But anyways, uh, the microphone that's sitting in front of me is, uh, just, like I said, somewhat of re uh, a replica of it. But prior to the microphone, prior to the radio, prior to the uh, promoting of a politician and his campaign over the radio and later new movie reels or news reels and later still television, uh, the way politics was done prior to the 20th century, or at least the first uh, decade or so of the 20th century, was to do the stump speech. And when I talked about the crash at Crush in a previous lecture, the fact of the matter remains is, is that uh, that crash at Crush, uh, if you noticed, I'd said there were a bunch of politicians there, and they're going to stand on the proverbial stump, maybe literally a stump of uh, a cut-off stump of a tree, and talk to the crowd. Uh, and they're going to do it. They're going to be uh, gesticulations, arms waving, eyes bulging, you know, all those sorts of things there. Eh, er. You know, all those sorts of exaggerated movements, uh, things that uh, maybe just as I did that might look a little odd to you on this uh, recorded lecture. But anyways, that's the, it was a very much an emotional, emotional, emotive. Some people screamed, some people hollered, some people dropped their voice, but it was really uh, very demonstrative is really the word I'm looking for, a demonstrative t style of speaking. Uh, one of the early Texas politicians, I probably will just mention him here. I don't know that I'll mention him again for the rest of the semester, uh, but you could spend a lecture on this man. He's uh, so consequential. Uh, and not in a good way. He's one of the real scoundrels in Texas history who uh, populated government. Uh, that man's name is uh, Jim Ferguson, James, uh, Jim Farmer Jim Ferguson. Anyways, sometimes people call him Gentleman, uh, G uh, Gentleman Jim, but pfft, that wasn't true. Ferguson was one of the great late, uh, last great stump speakers in Texas history. But by the time you get, he was a governor and he got impeached, and that's why I say he's a scoundrel. Uh, but anyways. Pappy O'Daniel, however, is a new type of politician. He's a new type of salesman. Uh, Rose, Franklin Roosevelt was a very good uh, politician in his own right, and he understood it uh, this new way pretty well. Johnson's a great politician, as I've said many, on several occasions already. The thing is, is that Johnson was a better stump speaker than he was a speaker over the radio or over television, in my opinion. Uh, and I think he wasn't bad, I just think he wasn't as good as Pappy. But the thing about Pappy, and this is the story that I really want to get into, is how does he get to politics? How does he become a celebrity? And I, you ought to write that down. Pappy O'Daniel was a celebrity. Everyone knew his name. Well, part of it has to do with the radio. Maybe a lot of it has to do with the radio. And see, the thing is, is that uh, Pappy just kind of lucked into it. He, he kind of stumbled into uh, his uh, gig as a radio personality. Uh, he, he did not intend to. But one day in the early 30s, one of his, uh, about, probably about 32, 33, 1932, 33, one of his uh, uh, announcers uh, called in sick, couldn't come in, what have you. Uh, and the uh, Burris Flour Mill sponsored and had a noontime program. 
uh, you got to understand is, is that it's not as is not as forward or as prevalent today as it was in the past. That you still see it occasionally. Uh, but uh, in times gone by, uh, radio time was filled in often by uh, lengthy advertisements, a program, uh, say the Dodge Trucks uh, Comedy Hour, the Dodge uh, Tr- Comedy Hour, uh, the Ford Motor Company This or That Hour. It, anyways, and that's all I'm thinking, radio, TV on that case. But in this case here, emanating and coming out of Fort Worth in Dallas, uh, the Burroughs Flour Mill had what was called, put it in your notes, the Flour Hour. It was actually a 30-minute program. It was not an hour long for uh, most of the time, but it was, it was called the flower hour. Not like the flower of uh, the field, uh, though you could imagine that if you want to, but it's spelled F-L- F-L-O-U-R, the flower of Burris, flowers, flour mill, you know, the, the cook, uh, the light crust. Uh, and the flour mill, the Burris flour mill hired, put this in your notes as well, they hired themselves a band. That was not uncommon to have a house band by a company. Not necessarily, you could have a big band. There are several big bands like by a Ford Motor Company. But even smaller, far smaller corporations or businesses would have house bands that they would sponsor and they'd travel around singing and putting on free concerts and such and promoting, of course, their sponsor. Uh, you see versions of this to, to this day. Uh, just was far more common back in the time when you had to make your entertainment versus being entertained by an iPhone or a computer or television or something like that. So, uh, and I'd say this too, dances and dance halls uh, were far more common uh, and popular than they are today. Uh, I'm not saying you, none of you will ever go to a dance hall. Don't get me wrong, some of you will go dancing this weekend. But the idea of going dancing every uh, weekend or a couple times on a weekend, every weekend or most weekends, uh, it, whether you spent a lot of money there or you just drank one, one or two beers and you danced the night away and paid the cover to get in the door, a lot of uh, young to middle-aged Texans found re- uh, relief, uh, especially the heat, uh, at least kept your mind off of the fact that you were burning up and sweltering in your house. And so you went dancing and you got out. Uh, far more common is my point. But in, in order to promote that, uh, you would promote the flower. And, of course, the flower is not directed toward the dance hall boys, uh, though the Light Crust Doughboys is their name, the name of the band, the Light Crust Doughboys, would play dances occasionally. The fact is, is that they're mostly a house and, and a studio band that uh, played uh, various and sundry songs and what have you. So the Light Crust Doughboys, that's their, uh, that's their thing. Uh, they, are, they are a house band, and they, to my, they may still be running around today, uh, but I don't think, I think they folded up somewhere around the year 1990 or 2000. But anyways, in the 1930s and 40s, and even into the 50s, they were quite prominent and so on. Uh, by the way, before I move on and just tell you the story about how Pappy got into radio particularly, please put this in your notes. It's, it's worth noting that there were some very prominent politicians who came out of the Light Crust politicians, very prominent musicians who came out of the Light Crust Doughboys. The man, uh, one man who comes out of there, uh, put his name down. He's the father of Western Swing, which is a type of music, uh, is a guy named Milton Brown. Now, Milton Brown is not going to live that long. He dies in a car accident in 1936, but he kind of was able to begin what uh, he, he's the first real proponent and arguably the best. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll go that far, but he's arguably the best of the uh, Western swing artist. But uh, I said he's the father of Western swing, but at the same time, like I said, he dies in a car accident in 36, and that's the end of his story. But the more important of the two names I'm going to give you is this second one. And the second one is uh, his nickname is the King of Western Swing. Well, he's far more prominent and popular because of what he does and how he acts. And it's, it's, uh, it's a real production. And he starts out... In the uh, he starts out as a uh, flower salesman and a light crust doughboy. He worked in the Burris Mill when he was a young man, and that man's name is Bob Wills. Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. That's at, of course after he leaves the uh, Burris Flour Mill. Bob Wills and Pappy did not get along all that well. Bob Wills was a young man, headstrong, had ideas of what he wanted to do, all that sort of stuff. And, oh, by the way, Wills had a well-known and uh, really, I'd say, almost lifelong struggle with a bottle. Uh, 
uh, meaning he uh, he could get drunk and sometimes miss shows. He wasn't quite, uh, never quite gained the reputation of no no show Jones or that's George Jones, uh, who who had a bad reputation in the '70s and early '80s for just not going, not playing dances though he was uh, or uh, concerts, but even though he was scheduled to do so because he was drunk. Uh, but Wills did fight the bottle, and and um, when it comes to the bottle. Uh, O'Daniel, Pappy O'Daniel was uh, not just a teetotaler, meaning he didn't drink. O'Daniel was also pretty rigid on that subject, and it's it's you know it's it's to this day it's worse uh, more so uh, than it is uh, back then. Today, if you get uh, if you show up drunk on the job, uh, good chances are you're going to be fired. Uh, just even the first time you show up drunk on the job, especially if it's a job that it, uh, includes something that could get the uh, company or the business sued uh, or bring disrepu- uh, disrepute on the company. So um, I would not suggest going drunk to a job. But in the 1930s, uh, there was more forgiveness, I suppose, uh, maybe more uh, uh, tolerance of being drunk or at least a little bit tight, uh, meaning you have had a drink, but you're not drunk or have a couple of drinks, but you're not drunk on the job. Uh, but Pappy and Wills are going to butt heads a lot. And finally, he Wills just moves on and he's effect, effect, effectively fired for being drunk on the job too much and just a clash of personalities. But Wills was not a falling down drunk most of the time. He just had, he bottled the bottle. But Wills also was fired by this idea of a type of music that he wanted to play. And this is what I really want you to make note of now, is is that he is going to leave an indelible mark upon country music. And when I say the word Western swing, that is not the same as country music. They're in the same, if you're talking about a pavilion, you're talking about an umbrella and being under the, everybody being under the same umbrella, then yes, that would be fair. But a Western swing has a, is a different play, a different type of music than what you get with uh, traditional country of the 1920s and 30s. Traditional country of the 1920s and 30s is going to be heavily dependent upon guitars, uh, banjos, uh, perhaps uh, a few other stringed, uh, maybe a fiddle, but maybe not, uh, some other stringed instruments. But it was really just strum and chord, strum and chord, strum and chord. Uh, you're certainly not going to have drums. You're not going to have trumpets or anything like that. Uh, certainly no piano. And, uh, but country music, uh, in that sense, like say, put this man's name in your notes, he'd be somebody who would be a, a great uh, example of the early days of country music and was kind of one of the fathers of country music. Uh, a guy named Jimmy Rogers, the, the singing brakeman, as he was uh, called. And he was really the first great star of uh, country music. But if you listen to Jimmy Rogers, it's, uh, there's a certain twang to it that would come out of the mountains of Tennessee or Kentucky. But you'll also, if you listen to the music, you can also hear a certain twang, that, I say twang, but really a certain uh, sound that would have come out of the sharecrop, the, the uh, African-American sharecroppers of the South. Uh, what uh, Rogers was from Mississippi, and so you do have a little bit of a melding of the music. And Rogers himself actually would record with, uh, I believe it was Louis Armstrong, before he Rogers died of tuberculosis in the mid about 1935. Well, anyways, uh, so you have Rogers. Uh, that would be one. And, and Wills was influenced by Rogers to a degree, but Bob Wills, uh, as he's going to start to conceive of and to build his music uh, musical empire up. Uh, and he's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, and he, by the way, did not always, he oftentimes did not get along with the country music uh, establishment because he was so out there. He was so different from what they, they said country music has to be. Country music is this. And it was the guitar and maybe a fiddle and a few other things, the banjo. But Wills is going to take about two or three uh, types of music and weld them and meld them together at times, uh, emphasize one, downplay the other. Uh, the types of music, of course, one is country. You will hear Scottish reels. You'll have, hear stomps. You'll especially Wills' early stuff of the 1930s. You'll hear music that sounds a lot like what Rogers sings and plays, and some of them just uh, covers his music. Uh, but the thing to remember is, even there, you'll see Wills pick the pace up. Uh, this is a dancing music, and Wills doesn't slow it down, uh, which sometimes I think, uh, I, I say this, I say sometimes it seems like, uh, particularly in certain circles of music, they want to slow it down to where it's just plodding along, and you're like, come on, pick the pace up, buddy. Uh, not everything has to be played fast, and not everything should be played fast. But what Wills was doing, he's playing dance hall music, and he picks it up, and he rearranges the music, and he makes it swing, as he liked to say. 
in the early days, you can hear that. But you'll also see Wills uh, bring in, even in the 1930s, he will take even old traditional country songs, so to speak, that were actually oftentimes songs that came over on the boat with the immigrants, the Scottish immigrants of the 17, late 1700s. Write that down. I mean, some of these uh, songs that are going to be played will come across on the boat. Uh, next thing, though, is, is that Wills, will, who grew up in he grew up in Texas. Wills was not a city boy, uh, though that's where he comes into pro- he starts to come into prominence with uh, O'Daniel. But Wills is a, is not a city boy. Uh, Wills uh, was born in a little old crossroads called uh, Cossie, and then which is just uh, down the road from us here in Bryan College Station, or up the road from us if you want to look at it on a map. Cossie is uh, headed basically. It's a back route that you can take to go to Dallas. Maybe a few of you have taken that route home. Probably most of you, if you're driving home to Dallas, are gonna. It depends on the where you're going in Dallas exactly. When I say Dallas, I mean explicitly Dallas now. Uh, or the, the bedroom communities around Dallas. Some of you will go up to Waco and then I-35 and shoot up that way. Some of you go to uh, take uh, Highway 21 to Madisonville and then go up I-45 and go flying. Uh, I say flying, I mean literally driving 75, no, that's slow, 85, 90 miles an hour up I-45. Because I learned lo- a few years ago, if you, if you try to drive uh, just 8 or 10 miles over the speed limit on I-45 up there around Centerville and Buffalo and up points north, you're going to get run, run over. So, I mean, you're driving 85, 90 miles an hour up 45, so you can really boogie. So uh, you can take that route, or you can go through Grosbeck and Mahaya, and there's a little crossroads between uh, Grosbeck, let me think a second, da, 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 da. a little crossroads between Grosbeck ah, was it? and uh, and and Bremont called uh, uh, Cossie, K-O-S-S-E. So that's where he was. And, and when Wills was born in the early 20th century, uh, Wills was born on a cotton farm. Though, as I've said before in a previous lecture, all that land through there was cotton land uh, before cotton collapsed because of the, the Great Depression and so on. But he was a cotton farmer. And then the Wills family is going to move out onto the uh, Texas Plains up in the hill, not the hill country, uh, out toward uh, Lubbock. And they're going to move out toward level land in that part of the world, and they're going to try to grow cotton as dry land farmers, and it was a complete failure because it just didn't rain enough. But they tried. But there was the thing is, is that I bring this up is, is that uh, uh, Bob Wills' father, Johnny Lee, uh, I mean, it wasn't Johnny Lee. Anyway, Bob Wills' father was also a fiddle player. And so the father taught the son, but the son also was playing and listening to black. Uh, sharecroppers who they themselves had their style of music kind of more that bluesy uh, at times almost ragtime certainly the beginnings perhaps of jazz uh, but that blues style really that's really what he kind of locks in on Uh, and what you see with Wills is he takes because he was going to beer joints as a kid Uh, his dad played dances to make money and so some of the places they'd go were, and this is, you got to remember, this is an era of segregation. So there's going to be white, and I use the term beer joint, which some of you are familiar with, maybe most of you aren't. Uh, a bar is a beer joint. But because he did, may not have sold hard liquor, it was, that's, that's why they get the term beer joint. But it, in, in times gone by, the, the phrase beer joint caught it all. Uh, but basically, you mostly sold beer. Anyways, when it comes to uh, uh, the Wills, Bob Wills, he, he went to white beer joints and he went to African-American beer joints. And so you'll find him as a kid, and I mean kid like 10 years old kid, 8 years old, 15 years old territory. You'll find him in his formative days listening to music being played by various and sundry groups of people. Occasionally you might even find him hearing some music played by uh, Mexican-American or Mexican immigrant uh, uh, itinerant farmers or more particularly, probably better said, is laborers in the field uh, who were traveling through Texas, and they'd have a a role to play too. Texas music is actually quite fascinating when you look at it from a historical perspective because you have so many different groups in the state of Texas, uh, and they they leave an influence. And I'm going to chase this rabbit just for one minute. But in Texas, you've got to remember, you have your Anglos, another way of saying white. You're going to have your... um, you're going to have your African Americans and and their style of music, uh, the, the blues particularly, but jazz and ragtime and so on. Uh, in addition to that, you're also going to have uh, the uh, Hispanic community, whether it's Mexican or Mexican American. The fact is, is you have that, and then you have your Germans or German Americans. Uh, they have their shotitzes and waltzes and such. You'll have the Czech uh, influence, and as you say, where the Germans, they basically run a belt 
across Texas from uh, Galveston more or less up to Houston and then uh, basically hug in about a 50 mile swath maybe a little wider, uh, I-10, and then they shoot up toward Fredericksburg and out into the hill country. I mean, if you've been out that part of the world before, you've been uh, along I-10, you may have gone to the city of Seguin, but Seguin also has a lot of uh, German influence as well. I'll talk more about that in a later lecture, but suffice to say is they had their own music. But if you've been down around Moulton and Yoakum and Quero and down there south of I-10, uh, or even right where I live in Burleson County, you're going to find yourself a good number of uh, descendants today uh, who have some, uh, or li their last name may be it, it may be kind of diluted at this point, but you're going to find descendants of the uh, Czech uh, immigrants. A lot of them, the Unity of the Brethren is the church that they all would go to uh, if they go to church. But the fact is they had a certain style of music and so on. And it, it, it uh, forced upon individuals uh, who were band directors and band leaders who were more local than Wills would ever end up being. Uh, here's a name for you. Put this guy in your notes. I didn't think to put him on the review sheet, but Adolf Hoffner. Adolf Hoffner and his uh, Pearl Wranglers, I believe it was. But Hoffner played all throughout Texas. And uh, now he's not one of my favorite uh, singer-songwriters from that era, from the 40s and 50s and 60s. But Hoffner played dance halls that were uh, catered to Anglos, to Germans, to check to uh, Hispanic you'll find them all throughout Texas playing whoever would listen and he could he could at least sing I don't know if he could speak it but he could sing in German he could sing in uh, Spanish he could sing in English and so on because he, he had to play whoever whatever they wanted to hear so you get this real interesting mix anyways back to uh, to Wills uh, Wills starts to weld that together and I talked about two uh, two or three influences I've got gave you two uh, one was the uh, Anglo-Scottish, particularly uh, shot uh, reels and stomps and, and, and so forth that they would have come over. Secondly was the uh, j blues, particularly, but maybe some jazz influence thrown in as well. It will, it will certainly show up later. And number three, uh, you'll get the big band uh, aspect of wills as well. So you'll start adding trumpets. You'll start adding clarinets. You'll start adding uh, uh, lots of different instruments. In fact, when you talk about the Bob Wills and his Texas Playboy, during World War II and especially the early days after World War II, Wills's band was as big as they could basically any uh, band out there. It's about a 12 or 15 piece band. I mean, it, he could do whatever he wanted to. He, he, he knew music quite well. He read it, but he was a great uh, director and leader and he just had that feel for it. Uh, Wills, by the way, if you talk about Bob Wills and you, you say, was he a great singer? No, he wasn't. Uh, he was not the best fiddle player, and he knew that too. He could play the fiddle, but he was a great promoter, and he was a great showman. Uh, the famous aspect of Wills himself on the stage was is that when he was, uh, especially when he was feeling good, some of that may have been aided by alcohol, and they always said, the, the band members, the Playboys always said, Wills was what is at his best when his ha home life was happy. Uh, Wills, uh, his home life, is, as many artists and many band uh, leaders, many musicians tend to be, especially the prominent ones, um, he was not uh, immune to... Uh, uh, running around, I'll say it like that, married multiple times, and so, I think he's married about half a dozen times, maybe five anyways, all that to say is, is that it, the, uh, the Playboys said, generally speaking, uh, his, uh, his band members said that when Wills's home life was happy, he was happy, and the band, and the music was at its best, great dancing stuff, and he'd sit there and go, aha, and uh, take it away, Leon, and so forth, and he had a very high-pitched kind of falsetto voice that stood out and it would if you ever listen to Bob Wills you start hearing ho these cat calls and these hollers some of which is just part of him feeling good and some of which was he stuff he mimicked from those uh, African-American beer joints uh, in his earlier days and so uh, he took and borrowed and he made a lot of money at it to be clear uh, really when you talk about Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys and they're going to play and be prominent for 30 years uh, now not all the same men uh, are in the band every band has churn uh, the best singer that Wills ever had was a guy who just mixed uh, made it up with him real well the guy's name is Tommy Duncan uh, best singer that Wills ever had and they ended up breaking up because of the the alcohol issue and Duncan had some ambitions and they were never the same again but uh, the three songs I want you to write down uh, for Bob Wills and his Texas Playboy are these. The first one is really an instrumental, and it has to do, and the reason I bring this up is because you see Wills is one of the first uh, real prominent Western swing style. Uh, I mean, 
heavy bass line ba banging away. I mean, and then just, uh, but it's got that heavy beat uh, and it moves. Uh, and it may not move as much as what you're used to today, but it would move quite a bit compared to what the country boys did over there in uh, Nashville and in the East. But the first song I want you to write down is an instrumental called Steel Guitar Rag. Steel Guitar Rag. And the reason I bring this one up is because, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrumental. It's, a, it's basically a reworked song. But the Steel Guitar Rag, you slide in. Because if you've ever seen a guy who's playing the Steel Guitar, he's got two hands moving and you might even see a foot moving. I mean, he's just a, he's a bundle of energy. But a man who knows what he's doing with a Steel Guitar Rag uh, is... Uh, is quite good, but you can, the thing I bring this up is that Wills was not afraid to go to electrified instruments, uh, particularly guitars, and of course, in this case, a steel guitar, maybe a dobro or something like that. Wills was not afraid to implement new equipment into and new uh, mu instruments into his band. A lot of old traditionalists would say they'd rather walk on hot coals than do that. So uh, Wills, uh, famously, uh, he was invited to the Grand Ole Opry once, maybe twice. I believe it was only once, actually. But the first time, anyways, that he went, they told him, uh, and this was right as he got there, and he's the headliner for the evening. They said, uh, Mr. Wills, you cannot use a set of drums at the Grand Ole Opry. We will not allow that. And Wills basically said, no drums, no, no Playboys in the Opry because they'd sold all their tickets. Uh, to the Wills concert, basically backed down and said, all right, go ahead. But they never invited him back again, to my knowledge, basically. So that was uh, Steel Guitar Rag is just because of the electrical instruments. The second song that I wanted you to uh, put in your notes that is uh, noteworthy because it's Wills' song. I think Duncan had a hand in writing it. Uh, but it became maybe his most popular crossover, meaning going from country, country western, uh, to uh, popular music. Because you'll see Patsy Cline record it, uh, Willie Nelson's going to record it, uh, Memory Serves, uh, Frank Sinatra, I think, recorded it, I think Tony Bennett has recorded it. But anyways, the point is this, is that there's a lot of individuals will record this song, and I'm, of course, partial to Wills, and uh, that song is the uh, song Faded Love. It is, uh, it's, when played properly and done right, it just has this mournful but beautiful moving sound and these words that go along with it. Uh, I, perhaps the, the best version, I say I'm partial to Wills, and I am, but that's vo uh, Patsy Cline's voice was a beautiful, she had a beautiful voice, and just you could hear the heartbreak in that voice as she's singing. Of course, uh, she dies tragically as well, as so many of them tend to do. Um, and the number three, the, uh, the song that in, for Wills himself that was most popular, and it did cross over some, and you'll see others sing it and play it, but it was really Wills' song of all them, was uh, San Antonio Rose. It starts out as an instrumental, uh, Wills reworks the music, uh, and then they add words to it, and boy, it takes off. Deep within my heart lies a melody, a song of old San Antonio. Where in dreams I live with memories beneath the stars all alone. And, that, and I'm going to stop right there because you're probably, your ears are going to start to bleed if I sing too much. Uh, and the, if you've got any stray dogs wandering around your apartment or condominium or wherever you're watching this, they're going to start assembling if they hear me sing too much and start banging at the, at the sound of my voice. I'm a bad singer. I may be a lot of things, but a singer, I ain't one of them. I know my limitations in that sense. My wife says, uh, she tells me when we were in the church to, singing together, uh, it's back before the, the virus, of course, uh, she will say to me, she, she's like, don't sing too loudly, dear. <laughs> and, and I, I, you know, the thing is, I do come from a family of singers, and uh, that, that gift was not given to me. Well, anyways, all that to say is, is that Wills is going to be a major figure in music uh, in the mid part of the 20th century. <laughs> That's a long rabbit to chase. And, but he comes out of Pappy O'Daniel's fold, and he does it. Well, back to old Pappy. Well, we left him 20 minutes ago, I guess. When we left him 20 minutes ago, he was locking horns with Wills, and Wills goes off and starts his own band, yada, yada. And that I said to you that O'Daniel had, uh, by accident, gotten into the uh, political game, had gotten into the, became a media celebrity just by accident. That is true. What had happened was is that, uh, as I said, one of uh, the announcer for the Flower Hour was out, and, well, you got to have a program. You got to go, and he, he he wasn't there, and so they didn't have anybody else. And Pappy stepped in, and he found out that he liked it quite a bit, and that he was not only he liked it, he was good at it. 
That's always, always the thing. Not only, I mean, you may like something. I mean, you may, some of you may like playing football. Some of you may like playing baseball. But in your heart of hearts, you knew you were mediocre, average. I'm, speak, I'm speaking about myself as well. I love baseball. I love playing it. But I couldn't run out of sight in a week. I could, my fastball was 82 miles an hour, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, maybe it was only about 78. But point is this. I, I loved playing baseball, and I was good enough for what I did. But I wasn't that good, actually. But Pappy was great. He was not only, he enjoyed it, but he was great at it. He was a natural self-promoter, natural salesman, and he made the uh, wise choice uh, to keep doing it. And um, he becomes a celebrity. He becomes a celebrity. And uh, how he does it is, is that the program would start out, and as it got bigger, all the major radio stations in Texas and even small town radio st- stations in Texas would subscribe to and purchase this flower hour to play every day, Monday through Friday, at noontime in Texas. It starts out on a radio station called WBAP. Uh, WBAP is in Fort Worth, and that stands for We Bring a Program. Other snide individuals in the 1920s said, no, 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 it means we bring a pint of whiskey. But radio itself is actually a fascinating story, and maybe I'll give you that lecture too uh, in the next, uh, as I go through it. Yeah, I probably will. Anyways, all that to say is, is that uh, it, it, uh, it's fascinating. When it comes to uh, these programs, you'll find Pappy everywhere, and he's, he's, he's a favorite. So what was the program like? So what Pappy did was he'd open up the program with a, with a song, and it was uh, this one. Please put this in your notes. It is called Beautiful Texas. Oh, beautiful, beautiful Texas, where the beautiful blue bonnets uh, grow. We're proud of our forefathers who fought at the Alamo. You can play, play uh, you can live on the plains or the mountains or down where the sea breezes blow. But you're still in beautiful Texas, the most beautiful state that we know. And that song came out about 1935. It may have been 1936, and that's an important date, 36 particularly. Uh, Because in Texas history, when you you need to know your dates, a few of them anyways, and this would be one of those dates, 1936, because it is the centennial year of Texas. Centennial from the uh, Declaration of Independence from Mexico and so forth. And you've had, as I've already referenced to you in an earlier lecture, you're going to have one of the great state celebrations at Dallas. You're going to have a series of celebrations unofficially throughout the state in 1936 uh, centered around uh, the uh, Texas uh, Independence uh, uh, Texas Independence, the centennial Texas Independence. So you've got to understand that song, which was Papio Daniel's song, uh, Beautiful Texas, which will also be his campaign song as well, is going to play very well when he is uh, selling all this flour because there are a lot of Texans, especially a lot of female Texans who are listening now, uh, who are a little more patriotic uh, than they might have been. Some of you who are watching this, if you were, if I was to press you and say, do you consider yourself a Texan first or an American first? Some of you would say, I'm a Texan first. But in a, in a year like 1936, it would be even more heightened. So it, it really goes well. And, and Pappy O'Daniel's band could play a lot of things. They were versatile enough that they could play, and it's really a country band, not a swing band so much, but it's a country band that could play uh, country music. They could play uh, uplifting music. They played religious music. You'd see, hear them play Amazing Grace or the Old Rugged Cross or something like that. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, just look them up. Uh, everybody's probably familiar with Amazing Grace. And then they would play songs such as, write this one down so you get an understanding of up, down, sentimental, syrupy, maudlin. Um, the boy who never grew too old to comb his mother's hair. I mean, as far as, so- as syrupy, maudlin songs are concerned, that's maybe no, none more syrupy than that. The boy who never grew too old to comb his mother's hair. And he, Pappy, would have those guys played, and he'd point to them, and they'd start up and so forth. Obviously, Pappy is going to be selling flour, but he mixes the selling of flour in, and he'd, got, he'd say, well, just write to us here at uh, the Burris Flour Mill, Post Office Box 62200, or whatever the number was, Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, Pappy then, he would, he would tell them to sing and play, and then he'd, he'd read a story. And Pappy encouraged his listeners to write to him. And for a widow, um, Pappy may have been the voice that she heard, and a widow, that widow may have taken Pappy up on it and said just to, to relieve the, the tension or perhaps the boredom of being a widow. I'm not saying she had no friends, but maybe she had very few friends, but Pappy was her friend. Uh, 
But what made Pappy good at it was is that he had a unique insight uh, that others pick up on. Roosevelt picked up on it rather early, and others too. But Pappy uh, had a unique insight about this, this microphone. And this is what made him good. And uh, I'll illustrate it by the fact that by the time, say, 35, 36 rolls around, maybe this was 37 even, one of Pappy O'Daniel's friends, just a friend that lived next to Pappy sort of thing, uh, said, uh, Pappy, you are so popular now. Everybody listens to you. How do you do it? And so Pappy said, come on and watch me. I'll show you. And Pappy had thought about it enough that uh, he knew what he was doing. He knew how he did it. And so... Pappy would sit behind a desk, uh, just think of the small schoolhouse desk, you might agree, I say they may not even have those, maybe if you grew up in a poorer school district you might have had one, but a small desk that you might have something akin to say in third grade or fifth grade or whatever, not anything big like I'm sitting behind right now, or maybe something, uh, a big desk that you're sitting at Blinn, uh, but something smallish is my point. Pappy would have that microphone set in front of him. Uh, there, this has been a recording studio, of course. This is a broadcast studio, actually. Uh, Pappy would have his copy, would have his notes laid out in front of him, the stories he'd want to tell, the, the, the letter that he wanted to read, uh, you know, basically the order of uh, the, the uh, program. And, uh, and then the, the doughboys would be over to, say, his left, and they'd be standing around a microphone that dropped out of the ceiling. And so Pappy, they had a list of songs to sing, and they all knew him, of course. They didn't have to wonder what's going to happen next. And the program would unfold and so forth. And so Pappy, that's the way it normally worked. It worked that way pretty much every time. Of course, selling flour and telling stories, um, some happy, some joy, some, uh, some melancholy. So Pappy uh, says to uh, this man, come watch me. And this man comes and sits in the corner of the room, just quiet, and that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, and he's watching Pappy go through the motions, and Pappy picks up a, a, a letter, and he says, I have a letter, basically to the audience, he says, I have a letter that I'd like to read to you from uh, Miss uh, Myrtle Jones of uh, Granbury, Texas. Uh, she writes to me today telling me about her uh, son who died in the World War, or actually would have probably said died in the Great War and uh, that she misses him dearly, and th today would have been his 35th birthday, but uh, he died uh, when he was about 20 years old. And in honor of the, the sacrifice of Mrs. Uh, Jones's uh, son, we'll sing The Boy Who Never grew, out, grew Too Old to Comb His Mother's Hair. And he points over to the micro points over to the doughboys, and they start into it. And you've got to understand, too, as I'm telling the story, I'm not that good of an actor. But the thing was is that as he read the letter, and it's, it's, a, it's a long enough letter, as he, Pappy, read that letter, the tears start to come down his face. And he's crying. And you can hear the tremble of emotion in the voice. And, and not, the, not the false, fake way that a modern politicians do when you hear them have that catch in the voice. Um, was Pappy sincere? I, I'll tell you the rest of the story. And then after that happens, Pappy puts his hand over the microphone like that. Pappy looks over to his friend who's sitting there in the corner and says, and he's got the microphone over his hand, that's what brings it in, boy. That's what brings it in. That's what Pappy told him. And remember, the tears are still coming down the side of his cheeks as he has just told us great his story. Uh, he's read this letter. I guess what I want you to understand is, is that is two things, is, is that... Um, Maybe it's that one is, is that when a, a man is a, or a woman is turning on the emotions and the waterworks, uh, you better be a little careful because they may be trying to manipulate you through emotion. And if a politician starts to cry, and Pappy was about to become a politician, you better hold on to your wallet because that sort of emotion can open your wallet up in a hundred dollar in a modern sense, a hundred to two hundred dollar purchase later. Uh, yeah, you end up regretting it. But anyways, all that to say is, is the playing on of emotions. Uh, that, that was Pappy, and it's what brought him in. It's what brings him in, boy. That's what brings him in. So you got to be careful with those guys. And part of the reason why you uh, try not to lose your head all that much, I, I'm not trying to say you can't have emotion. I am trying to say is that when people try to bring out emotion, you need to, your guard needs to go up a little bit, maybe a whole lot. Well, Pappy in 1938, and this is the rest of the story now, Pappy in 1938 is going to be a, uh, receive a letter. At least we think he received a real letter. Because Pappy could be a little, like I said, a salesman and maybe a little bit of a liar too, or at least um, stretch the truth. 
Anyways, he said he received a letter from a, a listener in 1938 in Texas is a governor's race. It's, there's, in Texas, every two, every two years was a governor's race at that time. And so Pappy receives this letter, and the letter says, as, oh, I almost forgot to tell you this point, but just think about it, like I'm leaned into this microphone right now, and as you can hear me, I'm trying to drop my voice and to be a little more syrupy and, and soothing as I read. Um, it's fair to remember, too, Pappy also had, this was maybe the chief insight, not just on the emotion, but Pappy did not yell into the microphone. He spoke into it very gently and warmly. He had a great voice, and it was uh, a very assuring voice. Uh, so to be clear about this, Pappy he likened a microphone, kind of like I've leaned into just now. Pappy likened this li microphone to that of a woman's ear. Now, obviously, that was most of his audience. We know that. But there's a lot of wisdom in that politically in that you don't go yelling into the air, just like I did. You speak softly and comfortably into it. Uh, if you want uh, someone to buy your product, well, then you don't yell at them. You talk to them. You reason with them, as it were. Now, you will employ emotion. And Pappy has this letter now in 1938 saying, Pappy, you're a good man. We know that. You are an honest man. We can sense and feel that. Pappy, all these other politicians, why they are criminals and crooked and horrible. We, in the depths of this depression, we, uh, Pappy, we need you to run for governor. Pappy, would you run for governor? Please. And oh, Daniel, whether he had thought about this, maybe he had conjured up this letter in the sense that he made it himself, uh, we don't know. Maybe Pappy, in the, when it was all said and done, Pappy O'Daniel had really received a letter from a listener because he had thousands of listeners throughout Texas and elsewhere. Maybe one of them did send him a letter in the middle of 1938 saying, you need to run for governor, Pappy. They're all Democrats back then, mind you. And Pappy said, sure, sure. I've never thought of that. If you think that I need to run for governor, please call me. Please te uh, telegraph, uh, telegram me. Please write me and tell me if I need to run for governor. Or if you think I should stay out of it, you please tell me that as well. I value your opinion. Please let me know. And so, of course, he gives out his uh, letter and number and his address and so forth. And uh, it's really good it's really good salesmanship because now he's got a whole bunch of addresses to people that he can send promotions to. He can send uh, order forms for more flour and so forth. The response was overwhelming, and it said, Pappy, run. And Pappy O'Daniel, Wilbert Lee O'Daniel, who had basically never voted for a political office a day in his life. He was about as political as my dog Buster is. He runs for governor of Texas in 1938 on a platform of basically the Ten Commandments, Mom and Apple Pie. And I'm not kidding when I say that, basically. Uh, it was the Ten Commandments. He wins in a landslide. He wins and beats everybody out there. And there was no runoff, which was uh, what shocked most uh, veteran observers. Most people at first thought he was a joke candidate. And then he won and won bigly, to use a phrase from another politician who's kind of like the same way. The thing is, is that uh, he ran and became governor. His inauguration in 1938 was attended by thousands of Texans, uh, which was extraordinarily high. No one had ever seen that many people come to see oh, Daniel or any governor be inaugurated, and normally the governor is inaugurated on the front steps of the Capitol building there in Austin. But because the crowd was so big and Pappy was different, they said, let's not do it there. Let's have him inaugurated and sworn in, not at the Capitol. Uh, let's do it at Memorial Stadium, the University of Texas football stadium, Memorial Stadium there in Austin. And so Pappy was sworn in. They had thousands and thousands of pounds of barbecue. It was a, it was a big blowout. Pappy had no idea what he wanted to do as governor. He just knew that he liked to get elected. He liked to be popular, and he still ran his radio program out of the governor's office. Um, he was a failure as governor. That man no, knew, knew, uh, the, no more knew the levers of power than my uh, dog buster, as I like to say. Well, anyways, Pappy, his first term was uh, mediocre at best. He has opposition. He runs in for re-election in 1940 because uh, two-year terms, as I said. His uh, vote total goes down, but he's, he's not lost all his popularity, but it's going down, and you can see that. And Pappy wins re-election. And then in 1941, the uh, sitting senator dies. 
Pappy announces Andrew Jackson Houston, the, old, the last living son of Sam Houston, to be a U.S. senator. He dies in the office, and it's open. And so Pappy announces in 1941 that he was running for the U.S. Senate to take his program that had worked so well in Texas and going to take it all the way to Washington, D.C. to clean up D.C. So anyways, and now we're back to Lyndon Johnson again. Lyndon Johnson in 1941 is going to run against Pappy O'Daniel. There are other candidates running, but those are the two characters. Pappy O'Daniel in 1941 is the sitting governor. He travels around the state with his band. He travels around promoting here and there, and he does it uh, pretty well. Uh, Johnson in 1941 is going to run for governor, uh, excuse me, run for the U.S. Senate in 1941, and Johnson is going to do it as a New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt liberal. He, goes, he flies around and does this and that, and at the end of the election, you know, sometimes history repeats itself, sometimes it echoes. This, who knows, this might be an echo. On election night, on election night, Lyndon Johnson had the election won. And so on election night, Johnson had about a three or 4,000 vote lead. It was a, a, a little bit of a number, but it was close, but they, were at a, they had a comfortable lead. And the Johnson crew, uh, campaign, which had run a good campaign, was inexperienced in Texas politics. And so what had happened was is that they made the mistake. And the man you need to write down now is a guy named John Connolly. John Connolly was a future governor of Texas, future prominent politician in his own right, but associated with Lyndon Johnson at this point in time. But John Connolly himself said, I'm, I was the one who cost us the election of 41. He said, turn in all your numbers to the state, and their vote total was done. Well, Pappy O'Daniel still had votes that were coming in because Pappy had made deals with bosses. Texas politics in the 1940s, uh, in the 30s, in the 20s, but here in 1941, uh, there was parts of the state where it was legitimate, honest voting, and in other parts of the state, well, not so much. You'll have sheriffs and county judges back then, DAs perhaps. Normally it was a sheriff who would say to the communities, like, I like... Uh, this guy, I like Pappy O'Daniel, or I like Lyndon Johnson. And people, not everyone, but a lot of folks would vote the way the sheriff would suggest. And I don't mean this in a coercive sort of way. But sometimes there was more coercion than I want to give it credit for in East Texas. So you do have some bosses in East Texas. Down in, in San Antonio on the west side, you have... Uh, uh, bosses, that's the term I'll use, but you'll have a boss in the west side of San Antonio who says to his precinct or his area that he kind of controls, he says, this is our man, and you will vote for Lyndon Johnson, or in 41's case, you're going to vote for Pappy O'Daniel. And the numbers for Pappy O'Daniel are like 400 to 2 or uh, 500 to 13 or something like that, just outlandishly heavy toward the guy. The reason the, all those uh, folks on the west side of San Antonio vote uh, the way uh, for that is because the uh, patron has, uh, or the, the, the b boss, has been um, paid, uh, given assurances of support, however you want to say it, but basically uh, they have allied themselves with Johnson, or in this case, Pappy O'Daniel in 41, and they're going to start giving their votes, but they don't do it on election night. They, they find a, there's a, oh, a ballot box here and a ballot box there, and the next days the, the numbers for O'Daniel keep coming in. Same for Deep South Texas. Put this county in your notes. You're going to get it again. It's Jim Wells County. Jim Wells County. Now, Jim Wells County in Deep South Texas is uh, Alice, is the, uh, the home territory, but you also have Falfurious and, and uh, San Diego and down that part of the world. It's not in Jim Wells, but it's right there out west. It's Corpus Christi in the brush country. But uh, down there, this name needs to go to your notes, George and Archie Parr. George and Archie Parr. But George Parr is the son. Archie was the father. But they ran, they, they called them the Dukes of Duval County, the Duke of Duval. And George Parr uh, is, uh, is allied with, at this point in time, uh, O'Daniel. And all those numbers start coming in uh, day after day in about a six to seven days after the election was over. The, the election day had been had. That 1,000, 3,000 or 4,000 mar vote margin had dwindled down. And before it was all said and done, Pappy O'Daniel had won by about 1,000, 1,200 votes. And he be beat Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it's the only time that in, in Lyndon Johnson's life that he'd lost an election. Um, he had it stolen from him, and Johnson vowed that it would never happen again. And 1948 was going to be Lyndon Johnson's uh, great uh, re role reversal. 
Pappy O'Daniel, the rest of the story goes like this. His time as a senator was forgettable. He serves as seven, for seven years as a senator, but uh, as governor, as senator, he had no clue with what he wanted to do. He just talked a lot and did very little. Uh, and so by 1949, uh, when he leaves office as a U.S. senator, for all intents and uh, purposes, uh, O'Daniel's career was over. He was yesterday's news. The shtick was old. Uh, and so he lives uh, in retirement for about the next, I think it was 30, 20 to 30 years. Let me check on O'Daniel. I think I got him up over here. Uh, yeah, O'Daniel dies in 1969 at age 79, so basically about 20 years of retirement, uh, and uh, so that's that. Uh, but uh, he was certainly a self-promoter, and he's kind of a, uh, a blip on the story of Texas. But it was also the only, he's the only man, maybe through hook and crook, but he's the only man to, uh, to deliver a defeat to Lyndon Johnson, at least uh, uh, in Texas politics. And so part Four, I suppose, of the life and times of Lyndon Johnson, when we talk about the Senate election of 48, come up here as well. So we'll come up in the next uh, lecture. It's 55 minutes in. That's long enough for this uh, setting. Thank you.